After the stoning of Stephen in Jerusalem, the believers were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. They traveled up through the regions of Phoenicia and to the island of Cyprus, and even as far north as Antioch in Syria. They were sharing the good news about Jesus to all the places that they visited. Antioch was the queen of the Eastern Mediterranean world, third largest city of the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. Today it is known as Antakya and is a modern city on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean in Turkey. It was founded by Seleucus Nicator I, one of the generals who succeeded Alexander the Great. He built this city and named it after his father Antiochus. Off in the distance, we can see through the haze the Mediterranean Sea, where Seleucus founded a port and named it after himself Seleucus Piraeus. That's 12 miles from here, but it was connected in ancient times to this city that was built against the mountain. Alexander the Great defeated the Persians just a few miles north of here on the plains of Isus. The Jews supported Alexander during that time, and so he extended to them the offer of large tracts of land to settle this area. Seleucus granted them citizenship here in Antioch, putting them on an equal level with the Greeks and Macedonians living in this city. The Greeks had a great respect for the Jews. They called them the people of the book because both nations had an ancient history and an ancient language. The Greeks respected the Jews and gave them wide latitude in their practices. They allowed them to observe the Sabbath, to practice circumcision, to practice ritual baths, as long as they did not try and convert Greeks. That would be crossing the line. And so they were exempt from the Greek holidays, the religious festivals. They could practice their religion, focusing upon the one true God. The Romans continued the same policy of tolerance toward the Jews. Even while they were crushing the rebellion down in Jerusalem, the citizens of this city, who were Jewish, continued to enjoy their full rights. The gospel took deep root in this city. As the believers came here and began preaching and sharing Jesus, they began sharing Jesus not only with the people of a Jewish background, but also Greeks. Notice how Luke describes what happens in Acts chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. After the stoning of Stephen in Jerusalem, the persecution caused the Christians to scatter throughout the areas of Judea and Samaria and all the way up here to Antioch, modern-day Antakya. They were preaching the good news to Jews in all of these cities. Some authorities estimate over one-tenth of the Roman world were Jews. That is, one out of every 10 people in the Roman Empire was a Jew. A very large statistic. But there was even a larger percentage of the population here in Antioch that was Jewish. The disciples began to share the good news, not only with Jews here in this city of Antioch, but they began to share it with Greeks as well. You see, there were many people in the Roman world who were tired of the polytheism of Greece and Rome. They were tired of the multiplied gods. And they saw in the one God of the Jews a simplicity of worship. They were attracted to monotheism. They preferred the God of the Jews. We'll see them referred to throughout our series as God-fearers. Some authorities estimate that 25% of the Roman world were God-fearers. That's one out of four that preferred the Jewish religion. But they did not go all the way to become Jews by being circumcised. And so the gospel takes deep root here in Antioch. A number of the people in this city believe. Let's read on in our passage. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, 
he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The church was exploding. The apostles down in Jerusalem asked Barnabas to go up to Antioch and to e examine the situation, to organize the church that was growing and developing here in this great metropolis. When Barnabas reached the city that was nearly 300 miles away, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. Tremendous numbers of both Greeks and Jews believing in Jesus as Messiah. Barnabas traveled the 90 miles up the coast to the city of Tarsus to look for his old friend Saul. He asked Saul to come back and help him to teach in this new church that was growing in Antioch. The two men walked back the 90 miles to the metropolis of Antioch and here they taught the disciples for over a year. It was a thrilling time. The believers became so numerous that they were first nicknamed Christians here in this city. Yes, they were so odd and peculiar as a followers of someone named the Christ that the Romans and the Greeks called them Christians. This cave could be called the first Christian church because this is the place where the people who were nicknamed Christians used to meet. It's the earliest church here in Antioch and it's actually a cave in the side of the mountain. It's a very special spot to walk in this cave, to see the stone altar, to examine the tunnel on the side where believers could escape and go through passageways to various parts of the mountain. Yes, it's a very special spot, a very sacred spot. By the end of the century, the church in this city became the second strongest and most influential center of Christianity in the world. And when Jerusalem fell to the Romans and Jews and Christians were banned from the sacred city by Hadrian, Antioch became the strongest center of Christian teaching in the world. But the sad reality is that as you wander through the streets today looking for a Christian church, you look in vain. There is scarcely a believer in Jesus to be found in the city that granted the followers of Jesus their special name. There's hardly a believer to be found in the city that sent the apostle out on his three missionary journeys. When it was predicted that a famine would take place in the Roman world, a relief offering was taken up here in Antioch and sent by Barnabas and Saul down to Jerusalem. When Saul and Barnabas returned from Jerusalem and came to Antioch, the church was rejoicing and during a prayer meeting, a special revelation was given. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Luke describes how the church at Antioch set apart Saul and Barnabas by the laying on of hands and commissioned them to go out to new areas proclaiming that Jesus Christ was Lord. Acts chapter 13 verse 4 says, The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Yes, they walked the 12 miles down from Antioch to this port. In ancient times, this was a bustling harbor serving as the port for the Roman capital of Syria, Antioch. It would have been filled with ships as it was also the home of the Roman fleet based in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. From this port, Saul and Barnabas would take their journey to the island of Cyprus to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. They landed at the eastern port of Salimus, where Barnabas was from. They shared the gospel with his family and friends and the cross was established. The gospel was planted on this island. Luke describes how they walked across the island 
visiting the towns and villages and sharing the good news that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. When Saul and Barnabas and John Mark reached the western end of the island, they came to the provincial capital of Paphos. Here the Roman governor Sergius Paulus had his residence. Luke describes how that there was a Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus who was trying to oppose the work of Saul and Barnabas. The Roman governor wanted to hear what these men had to say, and this man kept opposing them. Acts chapter 13 and verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of day. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. What a fascinating miracle happens here at Paphos on the island of Cyprus. This sorcerer goes blind. He was rejecting the light, and now he walks around in the darkness that he had preferred. Notice the impact upon the Roman governor. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Luke describes how the proconsul believed because of this miracle that took place on the island province of Cyprus at Paphos. Sergius Paulus was the first major Roman official to accept the gospel through Paul and Barnabas preaching in their missionary journeys. He opens his heart and becomes a believer. From this point onward, Luke refers to Saul as Paul. Apparently, he adopted the name Paul, perhaps in honor of this Roman official who had been converted, Sergius Paulus. Or perhaps he began to recognize that the gospel was going to go more to the Roman world, more to the Gentile world. And so he adopted this more popular Roman name. We do know that from this point onward, he's referred to as Paul in the narrative of the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas and John Mark sail from the province of Cyprus across the Mediterranean to Pamphylia. Notice the next verse in Luke's account. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Luke describes how they sailed across to Perga. I'm sitting here on the edge of the Acropolis, high above the ancient ruins of Perga on the southwestern coast of modern Turkey. The ruins of this city are spectacular. There's a theater that would seat over 14,000 people. It was built in the Greek style and remodeled by the Romans. There's an unusual raised stadium that would seat 12,000 people. The monumental fountain was one of the most splendid buildings of the ancient city of Perga. Built at the foot of the Acropolis, water from the springs was channeled and focused underneath the river god Sestros where it would cascade down as a waterfall, fill this pool where the great columns with the statues were standing, and then flow over again, rippling down and going down the aqueduct that ran down through the center of the city. The main street that ran from north to south was a double colonnaded street. That meant there were columns running down both sides with a portico and with shops. And then they had the modern convenience of air conditioning, as it were, with the water running down the center of the street to cool the city on this hot, humid coastal plain. It was to this city that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark came to proclaim the gospel. And from this city, 
John Mark would return to his mother and Peter in Jerusalem and Paul and Barnabas would depart and go up into the highlands to the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, proclaiming the good news there. We've come here to the modern village of Coven Leek, where this excellent section of the ancient Roman road has been preserved. It was known as the Via Sassunte. This road connected Pamphylia along the coast with the upland areas of Phrygia, Galatia, and Pisidia. Paul and Barnabas would have walked along this road, climbing the steep mountain pass on their way to take the gospel to Pisidian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch was a Roman colony. That means it had been settled by Roman veterans. It was known as the Colony of Augustus Antiochia. It was named after Seleucus' father and called Antioch of Pisidia to distinguish it from Antioch on the Orontes from which Paul and Barnabas had sailed. Paul says, it was because of an illness that I came to preach the gospel amongst you, the Galatians. Galatia chapter 4, verse 13. Many have wondered, did Paul contract malaria down along the swampy coast of Pamphylia? Is that why he chose to go inland to the rather isolated villages of Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and Derby and Lystra? These were very small towns in comparison to Pergi or Ephesus or Corinth or even Tarsus. Perhaps it was because of the illness of malaria, seeking relief from the hot, humid plain along the coast, up in the highlands where it was much cooler and less humid. It's also been suggested that perhaps Sergius Paulus was from Antioch of Pisidia, and that the Roman governor of the island of Cyprus gave Paul and Barnabas letters of introduction, references asking him to go to his family and friends in the area of his birth. For whatever reason, the two apostles left the coast, they left the major city of Pergi, and they began the steep ascent up this mountain pass and over it into the Anatolian Plateau, where they went to Pisidian Antioch and preached the gospel there in the synagogue. That's where we're going next. We want to go to Pisidian Antioch where Paul shared with both Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I'm walking in the ruins of the Church of Paul in Pisidian Antioch. This church was constructed in the fourth century upon the foundation of the earlier Jewish synagogue where Paul and Barnabas preached to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles of this city. Luke records how they came into this synagogue on the Sabbath and after the scripture reading they were asked if they had anything to share with the congregation. Did they have anything to share? You bet they did. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Paul and Barnabas came into the synagogue that has been located at this site. They came in on the Sabbath. And after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, they were asked by the synagogue ruler or leader if they had anything to share of encouragement for the congregation. Did they have anything to share? Their hearts were full. Paul stood up and he began to teach here in the synagogue, rehearsing the great history of God's people Israel, beginning there with the Exodus and how God had worked marvelously to deliver his people from bondage in Egypt and brought them into the land of Canaan, displacing seven nations. He shared how that God established judges to rule over the people, and then how he raised up Saul as the first king of Israel, and then David, 
as the second king. Then Paul shares with them the mighty moving in recent times of the preaching of John the Baptist, how the nation was stirred and went out to the banks of the Jordan to hear his message, and then how John identified Jesus of Nazareth as the Jewish Messiah, as the Christ. Paul had something to share with them. He shared Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ. Then he came down and focused upon Jesus and how the people of Jerusalem, the leadership, had rejected him as Messiah. And although he was proclaimed to be innocent by the governor Pilate, he was executed, an innocent man executed. But then Paul comes down to the focus of his message. It's what he shared in city after city, in synagogue after synagogue, that although Jesus was executed, he came back to life. Paul appeals to the Psalms, to the 16th Psalm, where it says, you will not allow your Holy One to stay in the grave nor to suffer corruption. While it originally may have referred to David as king, David's grave is still in Jerusalem to this day. But Jesus came back to life. He could not be contained in the grave, but was resurrected and appeared to many people throughout the city and to his disciples. Paul had something to share. And the people's hearts were opened. They believed and responded. Notice what Luke says. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Do you get the picture? Here on this site, both Jews and God-fearing Gentiles came together on the Sabbath. While they were there, Paul shared Jesus with them. He presented the message of the gospel here in this setting. And many asked if he would come back the next week and continue the message. When they left the synagogue, many continued to inquire about the message from Paul and Barnabas. But notice verse 44, a most amazing passage. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. The next week, almost the entire city, the word had spread throughout this great Roman colony, Pisidian Antioch. And the next Sabbath, the entire city almost came together, Luke said, to hear the word of the Lord. Again, Paul and Barnabas preached Jesus to them and shared about his resurrection from the dead. This was an amazing event. Was the gathering of the city as a result of Paul's preaching the first Sabbath? Or was it the result of the letters that Paul might have brought from Sergius Paulus, the Roman governor of Cyprus? Was it just the mighty moving of the Holy Spirit or a combination of the three? All we know is what Luke says, that the whole city gathered to hear Paul present Jesus the next Sabbath. God was moving but the devil was threatened. Notice verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talking abusively against what Paul was saying. Yes, when the Jews saw the great crowds of people, Gentiles coming to hear what Paul was preaching, they became jealous. The word jealous is perhaps strange in this setting. Were they jealous that there was a bigger crowd coming to hear Paul than came to the synagogue? The actual root of the word is the same word as zealous. The Jews were zealous. They were zealous for the traditions of the Father. They were concerned that Paul was presenting Jesus to Gentiles and allowing them to believe in the Jewish Messiah without first making them Jews. He did not require that they become circumcised and become Jews before they could accept Jesus as Messiah. This caused a spirit of agitation within the Jewish community. We read on, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. 
I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul said that we had to first come and preach to you, the Jews. But since you're rejecting this message, we now turn to the Gentiles. From this point in the city of Pisidian Antioch, Paul and Barnabas preached Jesus to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were thrilled. They were responding to the message. A mighty revival was spreading through this Roman colony. People were being converted. We read on verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Yes, the Gentiles responded. They were glad in their hearts, for they were accepting Jesus as their Lord. They had peace. Up on the top of the hill is the Roman temple to Augustus Caesar. Discovered there was his testament, which declared him to be the Prince of Peace. But now Paul is preaching the true Prince of Peace, Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, to the people in this city. And for the first time, their hearts are being filled with peace. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we thank you so much for the way in which you led Saul and Barnabas to leave the comforts of Antioch and to travel to distant lands proclaiming that Jesus Christ was Lord. In Lord Jesus, we see that we see that these Gentile and Jewish believers accepted you as the true Prince of Peace and how that you brought peace and joy into their heart and into their soul. And I pray just now that you'll do that for each one who is hearing in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. From here in Pisidian Antioch, Barnabas and Paul travel out to the regions of Lyconia, where they proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord in the cities of Lystra and Derbe. They're identified as Hermes and Zeus in Lystra. Tremendous crowds believe, but then they turn. They drag Paul from the city and they stone him, leaving him for dead. Don't miss the next thrilling chapter in this series, When Paul Got Stoned.